Thank, thank you. Man, I was wondering back there, who was they talking about? Boy, oh boy. I am excited, very excited to be here. Um, I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about, uh, today about filling the gap in all the different stages of my life and how filling the gap has allowed me to be here on this uh, red dot. So it all started out South Providence uh, many moons ago, revealed my age. I say about 34 years ago when I was about 10 years old, I noticed the people in the community and my friends and family, you know, they always used to talk about this gap. And, you know, I thought my smile was all right. Uh, so I, you know, I, I'd look in the mirror all the time. I, aluminum foil, now I'm talking to the real poor folks, you know, aluminum foil and put, you do this and I was like, man, how do I get rid of this gap? So then I started going to Catholic schools and different things that my mom would hustle to get us to. And, and then I, and she said, um, you know, we're going to work on getting you some braces. And I didn't know anything about that. I know the kids in my class had some braces and, and, and um, I said, man, I, I'd like to do that because I got to fill this gap that everybody keeps talking about because it's a problem, obviously. But as I was saying, I didn't think the gap was a problem. So I went on, got on some basketball teams, football teams. I'm going you know, to the hole and, and with the basketball, or the football, whatever sport I was playing. And the coach would be like, fill the gap. You got to get in there, fill the gap. So I'm looking at him like, what's going on with this gap stuff? So I'm realizing as I get older that there's some importance to filling these gaps. And I said, all right, I'm, I'm getting there. And then at, you know, a real pivotal stage in my life, you know, I graduated from high school. I was in the streets of Providence, you know, and I had a couple. There was only a few, you know, options. And, you know, if my guidance counselor would have got off her butt, um, I probably would have went right to college, but she didn't. Um, so I went to the military. I joined the military because it was either that or become a crack dealer, and mom wasn't having it. <laughs> so I said, you know, I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to go in the military. Please, be all you can be, all those commercials. I, I, I'm not worried about that because um, nothing's going to happen, no wars or anything. I get in the military three days later, Gulf War. <laughs> I said, what is going on with this? I thought I was going to go and just sail the seven seas and, you know, be like the commercials and just stand there and look cute with my gap. Uh, but I didn't get to do that. I, I went, I actually did sail the seven seas. And, you know, of course, one of my superiors came to me and said, you know, Dennis, you know, we got a lot of people, a lot of brave people out there, but we're going to put you out there. Now I'm 18, come from South Side. I'm standing there like, we got a lot of brave people out there, but we're going to give you this job because we need you to fill the gap. I said, oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> so now I'm really believing in this whole filling the gap. But this job he gave me, this job, I mean, it felt like nothing else. It was called Night Vision Watch. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this. And they, they put these cool goggles on me, and I got to stand at the, the bow of the ship, and I would stand there ship like this, and I'd stand there and look out into the ocean, and I'd say, man, this is cool, until one of my friends pulled me inside and said, bruh, you know what you're doing, right? I was like, yeah, serving my country, <laughs> standing proud, excited to be here, filling the gap. <laughs> I'm going to do what I can do to help out good old Uncle Sam, and he said, no, 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 man. <laughs> you know you're filling the gap, but you know if we hit a mine, you're the first one gone, right? I was like, oh, man, not this again. So I served my military career, a lot of night vision watch. It was great because at night I could see out there what no one else could see. Coming from Providence, Rhode Island, South Providence, that I'm very proud of, it was, it was a great thing. But when I returned, it wasn't so great. And I didn't have the goggles, but I, but I needed them. So what I did, I was walking the streets of Providence many days, many nights, and 
I started to realize we even without the goggles, I could see what other people couldn't see at night. It's crime, poverty, hunger, gang violence, stress, strife. And I said, man, now I know what they were all talking about. I guess it's time that I step up and start to fill that gap. So I started to fill the gap in youth services. About seven, eight years ago, the state of Rhode Island came up with uh, this ingenious idea. And believe me, I love living here. But they came up with this idea that we would stop servicing young people over their age of 12. We would stop financing their dreams, their hopes and aspirations. We would stop giving them a chance to survive past 18. How did they do that? They stopped paying for these young people to go to the Boys and Girls Clubs, the YMCAs, the recreation centers. Once you became 12, you were kicked out. To this day, that still exists. Now this, of course, special programs. There's a lot of programs out there in Providence doing a lot of great things. But there wasn't enough, not in my neighborhood, not in South Providence. So even though I thought about moving I said, why am I going to run from the problem? Many of my friends, they get their degrees, they get from the military, they come back and they move away, thinking they're solving the problem when all they're doing is adopting someone else's problem. Like all you proud Providenceites out there, give yourselves a round of applause for sticking in there and being here. All you proud Providence folks that stayed here, get your degrees, stay here, get your company, stay here. That's what I decided to do. But there was one thing different from me. I didn't have a clue how I was going to do it. No, no money, no fiduciary agents, no connections, so on and so forth. I said, man, I got to get this done. So while I'm throughout the community trying to invigorate others, give other people hope, you know, as I like to say, breathe life into the lifeless and the hopeless. Meanwhile, no money, you know, uh, barely making it, living in apartments, barely getting the rent. My landlord was my favorite guy because he let me pay the rent late, anytime. Kobe, I love what you're doing out there. Keep doing it. By the way, do you have that rent? And I say, no, nah, man, I'm still fighting out there, though. <laughs> he was cool with that for a while. <laughs> so, um, you know, I created Project Night Vision, and I used the name from one of the best experiences in my life, which is being on night vision watch, and I'm still proud of that. And I could see what other people couldn't see. My tagline was a safe place at night for teens, and it was for five, six years. And it was a project. That's why I named it Project Night Vision, because I knew I could not sustain this lifestyle. Why couldn't I, couldn't I sustain this lifestyle? Because I had children, and I missed a lot of birthdays a lot of celebrations, a lot of PTO meetings. But it was pretty hard to explain to the kid on the corner, hey, I can't be out here shooting hoops with you today because I have to go to my daughter's birthday party. They don't want to hear that. And at the same time, hey, my sweetie, I can't go to your birthday party today because, you know, little Ray Ray up the street and his gang, you know, may shoot up the birthday party. So what do you do? I'll know what I did. It, it took the strength from my wife to say to me, you do what you feel is right, and I'll be there for you 100%. So that's what I did. I went and started a program, it served over 5,000 kids over the last five or six years for free. They would get snacks, they would get dinner, They've been on trips. We go to Patriot games, Celtics games, so on and so forth. We've had press conferences. We've had rallies. We've had all types of events. We've even, we even coerced the president of the Boston Celtics to come down and stand by, beside me and act like he knew me just for us to get money. <laughs> he got out of his Lexus. He, uh, like a seasoned pro, got out of his Lexus. How you doing, Kobe? Hey, this is my buddy. Every channel, No channel was coming to our... Uh, our press conference, they found out he was coming every channel, every radio station, everything. And me and him were chumming it up like we were the best of friends. <laughs> He'd whisper to me, what's your name again? And I was like, oh. 
we made it. Thousands of dollars started pouring in, and because of my lack of business sense and even education at the time, I didn't really know what to do with the money. I knew one thing, I didn't spend it, because I knew, I knew about jail. As the last lady just talked about, I didn't want to go there. <laughs> so I took the money and, and gave it back to the community, to the kids. We had fancy uniforms. We had sneakers. We had tournaments. We started programs with these kids that you wouldn't believe. And I know, although I don't have the quantitative and qualitative numbers on paper, I know that it was effective. How do I know? Because I receive calls from these kids all the time. I receive emails saying, hey, thanks for what you did. I'm a better father. I'm a better person. I'm a better citizen. I see plenty of people with the United Unified Solutions Program, starting programs. We have grassroots programs all around the city. We like to call them programs that go from the grassroots to the grass tops, because that's what we're all about. I've been talking about filling this gap, which, if you notice, it actually filled in pretty nicely, <laughs> without braces. And the reason why I emphasize without braces is because you don't need money to fix something. You need faith, you need hope, and most of all, you need hard work. And surround yourself with good people. A lot of the good people out there in the crowd right now that are surrounded, let's give it up for them, please. <laughs> I've learned that you're only as good as the people around you. And boy, do they support me. Project Night Vision, as I said, was a program that operated from 5 p.m. to about 9 p.m. at night. Most of the crucial hours for young people. And why do I say that? Because those are the times, statistically, that young people go astray. So we would have sports. We would have roundtable discussions where we would just sit down and talk about the current events, the things that are going on, the things that are ailing our communities the things that they need to know to get to the next level. College, military, just being a good person, relationship building. That's what the program was about. We would provide snacks. We have plenty of great sponsors, from Whole Foods to McDonald's, Walgreens. All of those sponsored me just from a handshake, just from being a good person. The kids now, I'm sorry to say, they don't have a place to go. Because as I said, night vision was a project. And there was no way that my body could take it, my family could take it, they took enough. There was no way I could sustain those hours. I would work a full-time job, and then I would go home, throw, eat a sandwich really quickly, if that, and then go back out there to 9, 10 o'clock at night, five to six days a week, for five or six years. I was tired. And the community knew that, my family knew that, my kids knew that. So I had to, I just couldn't stop trying to fill the gaps in services. So I moved on to trying to invigorate people in other ways. Other ways where I could maneuver and, and, and get my schedule to be more conducive to my kids' lives. So I'm excited that I get to see my daughters at night. I'm excited that I get to speak with my son on the phone and talk to him without you know, 50 kids around me. I'm excited to see my wife and go out on a date once a month. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> she owes me one because I think we skipped last month. I have to keep on trying to push these young people to be better. It's not an easy job, but like I said before, I stand up here as a part of a coalition, as a part of a group, as a part of a movement. The Unified Solutions Movement, Project Night Vision, Rhode Island Midnight League, that's, those things are all to continue to uplift our community. They all involve, they have one thing in common, they all involve no profit. We are the epitome of a nonprofit. There is no money to be made. And I can prove that 
if you all walk five blocks down the street with me to my Hyundai that's barely starting. <laughs> I can prove that because I'm still living in an apartment. I can prove that because I definitely have to roll coins sometimes just to get where I need to go. I'm not ashamed to say it here before three, 400 people because that's real. That's what the kids want to see. That's what nonprofits are supposed to be. If you want it to go ahead and succeed and, and make all this money and become glamorous and so on and so forth, there's plenty of professions out there. Please leave the nonprofit sector for those who just want to improve the lives of others. So in my community, you know, a lot of times the kids, they're always searching for, for something that's not there. And over the times that I've been involved in Project Night Vision, we get kids and, and parents that are always waiting. They're waiting and waiting and waiting. And I like to call this syndrome, you know, the, um, the waiting on Superman syndrome. And I'm saying, you have to stop waiting for somebody that's not coming. You have to get up and do it yourself. You have to get out there, fight, vote, become part of the system, make it work, stretch the dollars, do what you can to improve the quality of life in your home first, then in your community. It will work. So I tell the kids all the time, sometimes you're looking in all the wrong places for your heroes. Sometimes they're right in front of you the police, the firefighters, the teachers. Sometimes they're right there. So, <laughs> make sure. That damn Superman ain't stuck the landing yet. <laughs> Been waiting for him to come myself. Many days waiting on the porch for my own dad to come home. It never happened. I was waiting on Superman to fix that problem. So until then, until he finally sticks that landing, you can count on me and my team and many others to get the job done. Thank you.